I just want to welcome everybody just tuning in online. We just went live. Uh, so welcome to all of you folks online. All right. I'm going to reset my iPad here real quick while you guys are greeting one another because technology is your friend until it doesn't work. All right. How's everyone doing this morning? All right. All right. Well, uh, that was awesome. Um, if we, I know we have a few first-time visitors. Uh, if you're a first-time visitor, would you just uh, wave at Phil there, and uh, he'll get you a, a visitor card to... Uh... All right. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. We're good. We're good. Am I looking good? There, how's that? Better? Buttons undone? Yeah. Ah, All right, come here, Eric. Come here. Help me out. Help me out. There we go. Got to look good, right? Got to look the part. Okay. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. Uh, I love church. We, you know, it's, it's okay to have fun in church, right? Is that okay? Can we have fun in church? Can we give each other a hard time just a little bit if it's all in good fun? All right. Uh, I just want to welcome, sorry, got in the middle of that. Welcome our first-time visitors. Thank you so much for visiting with us. Um, and uh, if you could just go ahead and fill out that card, um, we can get a little information about you. And uh, if you have any questions about the church, then you can uh, go ahead and write those on the card as well. Uh, you can drop in the offering basket, or if you want some more time, there is a drop box in the lobby in the back there. Uh, so you can drop it in the drop box anytime. Uh, but we thank you guys for visiting us. Uh, we appreciate uh, each and every one of our first-time visitors. Well, it is a wonderful time of our service this morning. You guys know what time it is. It is offering time, time for our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. We get to give. If you need an envelope for your giving, if you're giving by cash, uh, just wave at Phil there, and he will get you an envelope if you're giving by cash. Uh, just make sure you get your name on there. If you're a first-time giver, get your address on there as well so we can get you a record of your giving. If you're giving by check, you don't need an envelope. Uh, just write out checks to high praise, HPCM, or floodgates. Uh, any of those will do. We also have a giving kiosk in the back if you want to give by credit card or check card anytime at your convenience. Uh, you can make yourself available to that. And for our friends watching online, you can always give at www.highpraisecentralmn.com. All right, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your increase. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of your increase. It's interesting there that, that it's actually saying that we can bring honor to God by giving. We bring honor to God by giving. You know, um, if, if, if God is the God of our salvation, if, if uh, he has redeemed our soul, if he has cleansed us from all unrighteousness, if we're in new creations in him, um, isn't it the least that we can do to show honor to God? You with me? To, to, to show honor, to show reverence, to show respect for God? Um, but, you know, how do you really, I mean, if you ever th think about how do you show honor for God? How do you show honor um, to, to anybody? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you spiritually one way that you can show honor to, uh, to uh, both God and to uh, spiritual authority is by simply uh, listening to, to what is taught and preached and putting it into practice in your life. It's the greatest way that you can show honor. And that's one of the things um, that, that's really happening here is, is um, we're, the scripture is saying that we honor God through our giving. Why do we honor God through our giving? Because um, the Bible in many, many places talks about uh, how wealth, how uh, money, money itself isn't evil, but the love of money is evil, right? Uh, we know that, and God knows that. He, he knows that and he understands that because, um, you know, money is required even back, back then in biblical days, whether it was represented by livestock or, or denarii or today when it's all like digital. It doesn't really matter. Money makes the world go wrong. We need it in order to uh, operate in this world, and God knows that, and he understands that, and, and, and he's fine with that. Um, Jesus said, give to, to uh, Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what's God, God's. But God doesn't want want us placing money in a place that's above him. And because it's such an integral part of society, no matter what day and age you live in, then uh, uh, it, it's an important thing for us to always remember um, that God is our supplier and not, not our job, not government, not anything else. God is our supplier. And so we can honor God by remembering his commandments and, and giving our first fruits to him because it's placing him in a place above uh, anything that our job can provide, um, anything our own skills can provide. With me? 
Um, but the other part of the scripture that I love, it says, honor the Lord with, with your wealth and first fruits and all your increase. That word honor there is the word kabod. For those of you who've been around for a while, know the Hebrew word kabod is the word that uh, is many times used for the glory of God. Um, see, the glory of God means to honor, reverence, power, awe, majesty, that sort of stuff. And so in this context, it, it's talking about uh, bringing glory to God uh, with, with our possessions. That You know what? Uh, that, that there's actually glory can be, there's seeds of glory in our giving. When we're giving with the right heart, when we're giving with the right attitude, we're actually planting seeds of glory. Um, what, what does the Bible say? That uh, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in what? In glory. We're planting seeds into the glory, to the kabod, into the presence of God when we do it with the right heart, with the right attitude, when we're cheerful givers. You guys take your gifts in your hands this morning. Father God, I thank you for each gift. I thank you for each, each giver. I thank you, Father God, that as we give this morning, that your word says that you rebuke the devourer on our behalf. That your word says that you open up the storehouses of heaven and pour out a, a blessing that we don't have room enough to receive. That as we give this morning, um, that uh, we declare and decree that we are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, the lender and not the borrower, as we give cheerfully and hilariously in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Thank you guys so much for your giving. Uh, a few quick announcements I want to point out. We might as well just start with this one because uh, Kevin just did such an awesome job uh, about it. But... Uh, um, we have a healing and deliverance service coming up. We do do healing and deliverance ministry as well by appointment. Um, and uh, you can, any, if you're interested in doing it one-on-one, -on -one, um, Pastor Eric is in charge of that. You can talk to him or you can uh, call the church line and set up an appointment with him. But we do have a service coming up, uh, inner healing and deliverance service, next Sunday evening, October 22nd at 6.30 p.m. Um, this will be our regular floodgate service. Uh, so first of all, if you're interested in it yourself, clearly come and, and, and take part in it. If you have somebody who... who uh, might be interested invite them to come as well and i will say even if you are unsure even if you want to kind of check it out this is the perfect opportunity we don't force anything on anybody it's a service there'll be praise and worship music and all that sort of stuff and you you can participate to the level that you want to participate um we will kind of go through some prayers and things praying never hurt anybody um, but when it comes to the deliverance part of it, we will have in teams that will individually take care of that. And you can just, it's up to you whether you want to, to go and partake in that or not. Um, so it will be kind of, there's a corporate level of it. There's an individual level of it. And we will probably be doing some, um, the Lord is kind of directing me to do some sort of um, regional level of it as well. Um, but again, I invite you to uh, come to it, to invite uh, anybody who even has the remotest possibility of being interested in something like that to check it out. It's totally harmless but it is totally awesome, right? So I invite you, that's again next, next uh, Sunday evening. Also coming up uh, this Friday, Friday, October 20th, so th this, this coming one, uh, 6 p.m., we're going to be doing our family harvest party here at the church. Simply, we're just going to do potluck. Um, so invite, everybody's welcome. Just bring something to share. Big or small, doesn't matter. Joey's bringing something so you know it's going to be good. And um, if you want to dress up, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have some fun with that, with costumes and everything like that. There's, there's rumors that Sarah and I might be. I don't know. We'll see how that works. Um, but we're just, it's, it's just going to be a time of fellowship and, and fun with one another. And uh, also, I want it to be uh, a time where we just kind of recognize, I call it a harvest party for a reason, because it's the time of season for harvest, but it's also recognize the harvest that God has done in our lives in this past year. You know, and all the awesome things, a time of kind of remembrance of that and celebration of that. But so we, we invite you to come to that uh, whenever you can. Um, but we're starting at six o'clock. Bring something to share uh, if, if you can. If you don't, then don't worry about it. We, we'd still love to see you. All right. Uh, let's see. Anything else we did deliverance? So um, let's uh, I, say I don't have a slide for this, but. Um, one last thing I want to uh, kind of announce for the first time here tonight is that uh, starting in January, we are going to be presenting you guys with a new opportunity, uh, a new um, a series of spe specially designed trainings that we're, we are putting together right now. Um, that, that we're really excited about, that uh, kind of a track that God has put us on. Uh, we will be announcing more, more details about it as time uh, the time comes, but it's really designed to equip you guys uh, at, at a greater level, um, even greater level than what we do Sunday morning. For example, 
um, you, know, you realize that in order to receive at a greater level, and who, who wants to hear, here wants to receive all that God has for them, wants to receive revelation, wants to receive a healing, wants to receive breakthrough, wants to receive whatever, the best of what God has. You know, if, if, you, if you desire more of God, you desire to receive more of God, there's a biblical principle that says that we need to first be willing to give that we first need to be willing to sow. We first need to be willing to serve. So what does that look like? How do, how do I actually, uh, realistically, I mean, it sounds good when you're, I'm up here talking about it, but how do I realistically receive more when I'm giving more? And I'm not talking about financially, although that applies, but that, that's really not the, uh, the, the direction of it. I'm talking about um, pouring out, helping, um, just being there for others, you know, whatever the case may be, how by serving, by giving, by pouring out of myself, can I grow and become more like God? That's the type of thing that, that we'll be talking about. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited for it. So I, I just want you guys to be aware that that is coming up in January. And there's also some, some special things that are in the works attached to that, that we still need to work out that we're very excited about as well. So be sure to, uh, we'll, we'll be talking more about that in the coming weeks and giving you a little, little nuggets about it, and, and we'll uh, let you know uh, the details as, as we get them ourselves. All right, so you guys ready to get into the Word this morning? All right, so last week, for those of you who were, who were here last week, um, I had a plan, I had a message, and uh, didn't go that way. Um, God, God uh, totally just changed everything, and we did kind of an impromptu vision service uh, where we were just talking about God's uh, our heart and vision for this ministry with, a, with the, the vision that God has placed on our hearts. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. It was fun. It was powerful. It was good. Um, and it was completely unexpected. Um, so this week, it was actually kind of cool for me because I didn't have to prepare a message. It was already prepared. Woo! And uh, it was good because we, were, we uh, went away on a little ministry retreat to, to kind of plan for some of these things. And uh, I wasn't ha having to worry about preparing a message. So uh, what we're, if you were here two weeks ago, you remember we started a new series um, called Manifestations of Grace. Um, and so we're now going to, with that little pick up in the middle, we're going to continue the series this morning, uh, Manifestations of Grace. Now, uh, first of all, I want to clarify something. Two weeks ago when I spoke about grace, I, I misspoke something. It was just, uh, I, I just said it wrong. Um, when I was talking about grace, I, I said that grace is not unmerited favor. I, what I meant was grace is not only unmerited favor, okay? Just, just a little slip of the tongue. Uh, really, unmerited favor is the beginning of grace. It is just very, it's the first step of grace, okay? Uh, it, it's the first step on a, on a much bigger thing. Um, so it, it's like saying a football field is grass. I mean, it, yeah, it is, but it's so much more than that, you, you know? Um, so anyways, uh, so just want to clarify that, that, gra that the Bible does say that grace is unmerited favor, but that's just, just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to grace. But what is grace in, in its fullness? Uh, grace is, is not, um, not uh, what many times people talk about, grace covering sin. Grace doesn't cover sin. Grace empowers you. It's, it's actually power that allows you to overcome sin. Just as, as anointing is power that is external. When I lay hands on somebody and, and I pray for them and they're healed, that's the anointing flowing, okay? Um, that's external power being released. Grace is internal power, internal fortitude, internal strength that allows me to fulfill God's commandments, that allows me to walk out God's plan for my life. It is that internal strength and fortitude that comes through the cross, that comes um, through the unmerited favor of God, but it's so much more than that. It is power. It is strength. It is what allows you to be strong and courageous in the Lord. Amen. Amen? Now, um, uh, in manifestations of grace would be then, so if grace is power that's internal, and it's something that God has given us to overcome, um, if, we're, if we're tapping into that grace, if we're tapping into that power, because that power is available to you, if you've called upon the name of the Lord, that power is available to you. The trick is, is not everybody realizes that it is or how to tap into it. All right? And, and that's a part of why we come to church with people of like-minded faith um, and, and uh, connect ourselves with people that are above us so that we have somebody to follow and, and, and that sort of thing um, so that we can learn how to walk out those things. But if there's power that's available on the inside of us and we're tapping into it, then there should be some sort of outward expression of that. 
That's what a manifestation of grace is, an outward expression of God's power that's inside of us. So two weeks ago, we talked about wisdom, uh, how wisdom is not intelligence. Wisdom is making, um, is, is a godly application um, of knowledge, okay? That, that you can gather knowledge from all sorts of uh, uh, places, but wisdom is, is godly application of that knowledge. You can have proper knowledge and still do dumb things, happens all the time and we need to be wise in our decisions we need to be wise in our words and that is a manifestation of god's power working in us ex being expressed um uh, I'm, uh like i said well we're actually i'm gonna skip that okay so uh we're gonna start this morning in romans chapter 5 verse 17 romans chapter 5 verse 17 up on the screen there uh it says for if by one man's offense death reigned uh, through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace, so there's grace, and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as one man, oh, yes, for one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Also by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Verse 20, Moreover, the law entered the same, that the offense might. Moreover, law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the manifestations of grace, the power of God working inside of us, is righteousness. Grace is power. Grace is the power that allows... See, you see this in the scripture, that, that sin abounded, but the power of grace is greater than the power of sin. You know, that, that you are a new creation. Part of being a new creation is God's grace inside of you. You know, Jesus came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to do away with the law. The Bible says he came to fulfill the law. And we are, if we're Christians, then we are anointed in the same manner of Christ, that we are followers of Christ, that we are heirs of Christ. That means that we have the same power available to us that was available to him to fulfill the law, that we are called to do the same thing. How do we do that? By the grace of God working in us and, and an outward expression of that is the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God. So if we are called to be um, if, we're, if we're Christians and if we have the grace of God working in us, one of the manifestations should be righteousness. So then that begs the question, what is righteousness? Uh, what, what does that actually mean, right? Um, well, simply put, righteousness is right standing with God. It is a condition that, that a spiritual condition where we are acceptable to God. Um, sin is unacceptable to God. Period, end of story, Sin cannot exist in the presence of God, no matter how big, no matter how small. See, on the earth, we have this, uh, this view. Um, I, 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 saw, I saw a great analogy of this. Picture a, a cityscape, okay? And we look at sin as, uh, you know, kind of levels of sin. The taller the si skyscraper, the bigger the sin, you know, murder or, or uh, that type of thing, right? Uh, the big sins, right? And then there's some sins like a little white lie or a smaller building. And that's true uh, in how it affects us in life, right? That certain sins have a greater impact on, on the world around us, on ourselves, um, on, on our family and things like that. But f that's from man's perspective when we're looking at, at that, uh, that landscape. From God's perspective, it's from above. And from above, all of those buildings look exactly the same. You can't see the height, right? Sin, to God, in God's perspective, is sin, and it cannot exist. It doesn't matter how small it is. It doesn't matter whether it's a sin of omission or a sin of commission, meaning we, we uh, did something we weren't supposed to do or we failed to do something that we were supposed to do. It doesn't matter. Um, it, is, it's not, uh, it, it cannot exist in God's presence because God is pure. So righteousness is then that condition where we go to the Father with, without blemish, without sin. Now, on the individual level, level righteousness is correctness of thinking, it's a correctness of feeling and acting. It's actually very closely related to wisdom. You know, uh, that uh, if you make unwise decisions, you're not going to be living a righteous lifestyle, right? I mean, they're, they're closely linked together. So the question is, you know, many times people would, uh, w you know, Christians even would, would look at this and say, well, aren't we already righteous? I mean, isn't that what happened at the cross? We are the righteousness in, uh, in Christ Jesus. 
Yes, that is true. We are uh, the r- righteousness in Christ Jesus, but there's more to it than just that. It's, it's, there's, it's more nuanced, it's more layered than that. And to look at this, we, we're going to look at the armor of God. How many know the armor of God in Ephesians 6? Um, let's see if I can get them all. The, the uh, helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, and the, and the shoes, the sandals of the gospel of peace. Woo, got them all. Okay, um, and, uh, okay, and the pillum of prayer. But that's, that's another story. I, I can tell from Eric's look on my face. He's like, don't forget prayer. Don't forget prayer. Um, the, the, uh, but the breastplate is, uh, is, where, is what God uses to describe righteousness. And we actually find the breastplate of righteousness in the Old Testament as well. See, the thing about right, uh, the, the breastplate is, is that it protects our entire torso right? Front and back, it protects our entire torso. In that day, um, and actually still to this day, for the most part, uh, breastplates are actually two pieces. There's a front piece, there's a back piece, and they get latched together kind of uh, on the the shoulders and the sides and stuff like that. You actually had to have somebody put it on for you. You'd hold your hands up and they would put it on and latch it together. There's two pieces of it. And together, those two pieces of the breastplate protect your vital organs. They protect primarily, most importantly, your heart. And how many know that, the, that God has a lot to say about the heart in the Bible? The God, God is very concerned with the heart. He says, you know, wicked things come from the heart. Uh, the, the heart can be deceived. Guard your heart. Watch your heart. There's, there's tons. I think I looked it up once. There's over 500 references to, to, to our heart, our spiritual heart, not our physical heart, in the Bible. So what is our spiritual heart? Uh, simply put, if, if you want to understand what the heart is, uh, think about will. You know, willpower, say uh, you have uh, uh, a New Year's resolution that, say, that says, I'm going to lose 20 pounds, okay? Who's been there? Don't raise your hand. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to lose 20 pounds, and I am going to do it no matter what. I'm setting my mind to it. I'm, t- I'm doing this diet, that. It doesn't matter. Uh, I, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to diet, and I'm going to lose that 20 pounds no matter what, Right? You could, we could say that you set your mind to that, right? That you, you determined, you, 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 you made it uh, a power of your will to accomplish that goal. You with me? In the same manner, our heart is, is will is what we determine to do. Our heart is what we determine to believe, okay? That's what our heart is. Um, our heart is what we determine to believe. Here's the danger of the heart. This is why God is so concerned about the heart is you can determine to believe something that's false, it happens all the time. And when you believe in your heart, it's not just ideas and thoughts that you're considering. It's something that you, you decide in your core to be truth that is actually untrue. And that can lead to all kinds of heart conditions. We see it all the time. Even just with things with self-image where people get so convinced that they're ugly, that they're fat, that, 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 they're, that they're worthless, that they're a loser. And no matter what you say, no matter what you do, no matter how much they accomplish, you cannot convince them otherwise. Why? Because they determine to believe that in their heart. And it can lead to all kinds of destructive things. You, you apply spiritual things and it gets even worse, all right? See, the truth is the devil, if the devil can wound our heart, If he can plant wrong beliefs in our heart that we determine to be true, he can cause all manner of destruction in our lives. Um, Now, uh, like I said, just like there's two sides of the breastplate of righteousness, two sides of that armor, there's two aspects, and we're going going somewhere with this, um, but there's two aspects of righteousness in our lives. Uh, The first one is called legal righteousness righteousness or uh, or it's um, positional righteousness legal or positional righteousness this is what comes from salvation this is where we say that we are the righteousness of Christ Jesus it doesn't come from grace it comes from grace through faith okay then there is actual righteousness or righteous behavior in righteous works in order for the breastplate of righteousness to be complete we have and fully intact we need to have both pieces on Right? Otherwise, we are exposed. We are, we are leaving ourselves completely exposed on one side if we're not operating in both forms of righteousness. Now, legal righteousness, positional righteousness, comes from the cross. All right? 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay? 
We know this. We understand this. You've been in church. You've heard this. That it, at the cross, the greatest trade that, God, that uh, has ever happened in the history of the world was the greatest transaction ever happened. That we gave to Jesus our sin. No matter how bad, no matter, no matter you know, past, present, future, we gave him the worst of the worst of all mankind. We just gave it up to him in exchange he gave us his righteousness. How many of you know that Jesus never sinned while he was on this earth? That he, he never, uh, he was tempted, but he never sinned. He, he did the will of the Father. And he, we get that kind of credit. That's what was accomplished on the cross. The penalty of sin, the penalty of our sin, of your sin, of mankind's sin is death. Jesus took that penalty. He took our place. It's like being sentenced to prison. That, that you, the, the gavel drops. The judge says, you're sentenced. This is it. And then somebody steps in and says, you know what? I'll go to prison for you. You're free to go. That's what Jesus did for us. Okay? Now, when God looks at us, he sees the blood of Jesus. He sees the righteousness of God. He doesn't see any of that sin. He sees that, that pure blood, that, that sacrifice. He sees his his one and only son who is within whom he's well pleased. That's what he sees when he looks at you, okay? It's the same righteousness Jesus had when he walked this earth. But here's the thing. Being legally righteous, being positionally righteous, does not give us a free pass to behave however we want to behave. This is out there. This is out there uh, in the church, and it's dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. People say because of positional righteousness, because of the blood, because of the cross, that that covers my sins and I can go out and I can behave however I want. I can go to the bars. I can sleep around. I can, I can cheat on my taxes. Whatever it is, and oh, just covered by the blood. Just covered by the blood. Just covered by the blood. Many times we'll call this hyper grace, um, where it's an it's a inappropriate application of grace. All right? And, and I'm not shooting down people or ministries. I'm just talking about uh, theologies here that are dangerous because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Now, for a time, somebody can, can, um, can get by with doing that stuff, but sooner or later, if you're living a willful, especially if you're living a willful sin lifestyle where you don't be believe that you need to repent, you don't believe that you need to, to act differently, behave differently, and that you're actually using the cross as a cover to try to go out and do these things, it will come back and bite you. The wages of sin is death, and it will not be pretty. I guarantee it. There might be a time and season where it's fun, but it will come back. It's out there. Cause, but but here's, the, cause here's the thing. If, you, if that's your mindset, if that's, if that's your uh, approach to righteousness, you're only wearing half of your armor. You are completely, utterly exposed. And I would say probably the analogy is, is positional righteousness, legal righteousness, is, is, is the armor that's, that's on the back. Okay? It covers your back. And you're leaving your front completely exposed because you're just heading head first into sin without any protection whatsoever. Now, actual righteousness um, is, is uh, where we, we really see the grace of God operating in our life. Actual righteousness um, is walking in righteousness. It's righteous behavior. It says that we were made righteous so that we could be righteous. That we were made righteous, that, that, we, that transaction that God made, that, that clean slate that we got from the cross, the, the grace of God that we got from the cross was given to us now so that we could act the, that same way. It was given to us so we were made righteous so we can be righteous. That when we are, give our lives to Jesus, when we, when we call upon the name of the Lord, when we're born again, when we're saved, there should be an actual change in our behavior. People should notice that there's something different about our behavior, okay? We see this in 1 John 3, uh, verses, uh, starting in verse 7. It says, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. This is New Testament right here. He who practices righteousness, he who walks in righteousness is righteous. Just as he, being Jesus, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. You know, there's, there's places where it's just in Christian circles where it's, it's mean, it's unloving to, to even call sin sin. You know, that, this, is, this is not what I'm reading here. He who sinned is a sinner. He who sins is of the devil. 
For this person, purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. That means destroy sin. Whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed. The seed that's the seed of God remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. We're going to come back to that in a second. But I want you to notice there that he says you cannot sin. Well, that's strong stuff right there. What he's saying here is that, like I said, once somebody's born again, there should be an actual change in behaviors. People should notice something different in your life. Once you're saved, you should walk in righteousness. Now that you are righteous, you should live righteous. Okay, But it's not saying that uh, we won't ever sin again that we won't make mistakes, that, we, that, that, that uh, we, we won't miss it from time to time, whether that be um, you know, just sins of omission because we didn't know any better or sins of commission where, where we, we, we fell into temptation. Okay? Um, otherwise, 1 John 9, 1, 9 would be irrelevant, which says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's interesting. Look at this. 1 John 3 says that basically we need, we're, we're made righteous so we can be righteous. We need to walk in righteousness and we cannot sin. And then 1 John 1 says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive them. All right. John is not schizophrenic. This is the same book, the same author, just a few chapters apart here. All right. He is not contradicting himself. What is he saying? Because how can he say that we can't sin when he just said if we do sin, we need to, to confess? Um, this, this is what's happening here. What, what he's saying is, is if you understand positional righteousness, actual, or, um, um, the uh, legal righteousness, and you have that part of the breastplate on, and you understand walking in righteousness and living a righteous lifestyle, and you have that part of the breastplate of righteousness on, no matter what happens, God's got your back. It's as though you can't even sin. Because you're walking forward and you're, you're trying to live a righteous lifestyle. You're trying to do what's right. You're trying to walk in wisdom. You're trying to, to uh, adhere to the commandments. And guess what? You mess up and you, and, and you, uh, and you, and you miss it. You got that, that breastplate on your back that's protecting you from missing it. All you have to do is confess the sin, say, whoops, God, I miss it. And, and th thank you that you give me the grace, the power to do better next time. And it's as though you never even sinned. You can walk boldly and not be afraid of making mistakes. Right? That's what he's saying here. A manifestation, an outward expression of God's grace working in our lives is living a righteous lifestyle, is righteous behavior. All right? We need an understanding of both legal and positional righteousness, actual righteousness, uh, excuse me, legal and actual righteousness in operation, functioning in our, in our lives in order to be wearing the full breastplate of righteousness. Um, if we don't have an understanding of that, we're walking around with half of our armor. Um, so, in other words, if you're walking around and you're... Um, um, don't have an understanding of your legal position as, as being righteous, um, but you're trying to walk it out. You're wearing half of your breastplate, and th this is what happens. Um, it, if, you're n well, if you're not walking, uh, excuse me, I'm going to get these two backwards. If you um, understand your legal position as righteousness, okay, with me, as the, from the cross, um, but you don't understand actual righteousness, and you're not walking it out, what are you doing? You're sinning. Right? Just like we talked about, you're sinning. And sin opens the door for the enemy to create havoc in our lives, to steal, to kill, to destroy. You have a deceived heart. You are open to the enemy. Likewise, if you're trying to walk in righteousness now, okay, so, so you understand that I need to, to live righteous and, and do righteous behavior, but you don't have a revelation of the power of the cross, then what it gets into is a works mentality. And, uh, it, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that once we're born again, we're not going to be say we're not going to uh, be perfect. We're not going to be perfect, right? And um, we're going to mess up. And if you don't understand actual or positional righteousness, then what happens when you sin? What happens when you mess up? Condemnation comes in. The enemy comes in, and you have no. The enemy will come in and say, "Why are you even praying? God's not going to answer your prayer." Remember what you what you did. Remember, he, he does this, okay? He does this even when you do have an understanding. But if you don't have an understanding, he comes in and says, God's not going to answer your prayers. And if you don't understand legal righteousness, you have no reason not to believe him. None. 
You need to understand that. And then if, if, if you're trying to walk it out, I mean, we're talking about, this is what the Pharisees did. You're right? you, have, you, you have to, some, a choice to make. If, if you don't understand legal righteousness and you're trying to just, just walk out righteousness, you have to either wear a mask and pretend like everything's okay and, and pretend like you got it all together even when you don't and you, and you would be scared to death of ever telling anybody that you messed up. You'd be scared to death of ever showing any sort of weakness. Or you just got to give up on it entirely and say, well, you know what? I can't do it. I can't do it. It's, it's not worth it. I, I, I'm not good enough. I might as well embrace the dark if I can't live in the light. This is the sort of deceived heart that happens if we don't have a full understanding of righteousness. If you've made Jesus the Lord of your life by grace through faith, you are righteous. You have a legal right to call yourself righteous. And that very same grace will empower you to walk in righteousness so that, so that people can see the righteousness of Christ in you, so people can see a difference in behavior. And, and you, have that, you have that cross covering your back that you can go boldly and you can do what God has called you to do. You can boldly go forward and, and step into God's plan and purpose for your life. And you, and you can go boldly and try to be obedient and try to do everything that's right. And if you mess up, it's okay. You repent. God's got your back. That's righteousness. And grace is power to walk in that righteousness. Real quickly, I want to bring it back to the vision of this house. Equipping believers, building families, furthering the kingdom of God. See, without an understanding of positional righteousness, without an understanding of actual righteousness, you're going to be unprepared for the attacks of the enemy. Right? This is equipping you so that you understand the power that's available to you and the grace that's available to you, uh, the, the free gift of salvation that's available to you. You understand how it all fits together, okay? This is equipping you so that you have what it takes to go outside of these walls and do what is right. Building families. We won't have strong families if we don't have righteous families. We have to have a revelation of righteousness in order to have strong, godly families. With me? Furthering the kingdom of God. Why would anybody be drawn to the kingdom of God, anybody, if our standards of behavior are exactly the same as the world. If we operated exactly the same as the world, if you could, if you could go out to a bar and, and not tell who's a Christian, not, not a Christian, and, or, or uh, you know, some, if our standard of behavior isn't higher, then we have no reason to draw people in. Now, in the process of it, will people mock us for for adhering to some standard that they think is ridiculous yeah they will until their world comes crashing down that's what'll happen so you you will get you'll get scoffers you'll get mockers you'll get people to think you're crazy you'll get people that that think you know you're you're a jesus freak and well praise the lord yes i am all right but you are setting a standard for them and there will come a time and there will come a place where, where when their life is crashing down around them, that they'll go back and they'll say, you know what? I remember something Eric said. I remember how in the midst of this same situation, Eric rose above. I remember him telling me about his testimony. It seemed crazy at the time, but man, I could use that right now. That's what will happen. That's furthering the kingdom of God. Amen? You guys stand to your feet. Father God. I thank you for each and every one that is gathered here. I thank you that because we have put our faith in you, that we have called upon your name, that we are born again, that, that uh, we are new creations in you, that we have legal positional righteousness. We thank you for that, for that great transaction that happened at the cross where you took our sin and you gave us your righteousness. And Lord, I thank you that each and every one of us has a portion of grace, the exact portion of grace that we need to walk out that righteousness, to be living examples of Christ, to be living examples that there is a higher standard, that it is possible, that, that you have given us the power, the strength to be courageous and strong. And Lord, I pray that you give each and every one of us a personal revelation in our lives wherever we're at right now of how we can tap into that grace to overcome situations that we're facing, how we can tap into that grace 
to change long-standing issues, how we can tap into that grace to react differently to situations that it would have normally handcuffed us in the past. I believe that, the, that people are going to be able to tap in at new levels to the grace that's available to them as they walk out of this place, and that people are going to see a difference. That things, this is one of the ways that chains fall off. This is the one of the ways that things are broken off of people by understanding the power that's already there and then tapping into it. So, Lord, I release that over your people this morning. I thank you, Father God, that, they, that your grace is sufficient, that they have everything that they need to walk in righteousness. I thank you for it. I praise you for it in Jesus' name. As we go this morning, I thank you, Father God, that you give traveling mercies to each and every one. I declare in the name of Jesus, they are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. I thank you, Father God, that they are the lender and not the borrower. I thank you, Father God, you give them an opportunity to uh, express your love, to express your, your glory to somebody in this coming week. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Um, uh, but, uh, real quickly. Uh, before you guys go, if anybody needs prayer of any kind, I uh, invite you to come up here, and, uh, and Pastor Eric and Desiree would love to pray with you. And, and specifically, if, that, if, if, you, uh, if, if you listened to this message this morning and you said, you know what, I'm not sure if that's me when it comes to this legal righteousness that I've given my life to the Lord. I, I'm not 100% sure that that is me and that I'm saved, that I'm born again, that I have that legal righteousness. I want you to come and I want you to talk to Pastor Eric and, and tell him that and he will pray for you and he will get you set right. It's, it's a simple prayer and all of heaven will re be rejoicing. Aside from that, if, we want prof if you want prophetic prayer or anything like that, then uh, uh, go ahead and talk to them as well. And don't forget, we have floodgates tonight at 6.30 p.m. All right, praise God. You guys are released in Jesus' name. We're so glad you were able to join us online today at High Praise Central Minnesota. If you happen to live in the Central Minnesota area, we would love to meet you in person. We have two Sunday services, our Sunday morning celebration service at 10 a.m. and our Sunday evening regional outpouring service at 6.30 p.m. We're located at 327 9th Avenue South, St. Cloud, right next to Lake George. We have online giving available at www.highpraisecentralmn.com. And don't forget to follow us and like us on Facebook. We hope to see you soon. God bless.